Ephesians chapter 6. I'd like to preach a little bit about being a soldier today. Preach a little bit about the armor of God. and Just uh, the soldier in his armor. Ephesians 6, and uh, we'll just read a verse here, uh, a verse or two here. Verse 10, the Bible says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Let's just open in prayer. Father, we just uh, we pray again now, Lord, as we open up Your words, Lord, that You'd speak to us, Father. And God, we know that this book is where it's at. We know, God, that uh, there's no good thing, Lord, if, if we're not going to stick to the book, Lord, and uh, uh, the, the precepts, Lord, and the, the testimonies of it, Father. So we just pray, God, that you just uh, let the Word of God have free course, God. The Bible says how forcible are right words, so we pray for it now, Lord. Pray, God, these folks will get something out of it, get a blessing, Lord, encouragement maybe, Father, or just whatever they need, Lord. We pray all in your Son's name, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, if you did, weren't here in Bible study, I will make references to words Adrian said I couldn't say. So you just, I don't want you to be out of the joke, okay? Adrian sent me a list, Pastor Adrian, that sounds weird, uh, sent me a list and he said, don't, he was joking, but he was serious. So, uh, so if, I'm, if I stop and change, it's because I'm, I'm trying not to say, trying to say something is what it is. And we're going to preach about being soldiers, so, uh, so there's no telling what's going to happen here. Uh, <laughs> in this passage, the, uh, the Christian is pictured as a, a first century Roman soldier. Uh, this guy right here, it's talking about uh, wrestling. It's talking about fighting with a sword and uh, using a shield as defense and putting on all the armor and uh, uh, how the devil has wiles, which means tricks, and you're enduring and standing and withstanding. It's all about a fight. And something you know about uh, Paul that stands out in his books versus the other books, uh, you know what you'll see a lot in the, uh, the Old Testament and even in the Gospels? Jesus Christ likens Israel to sheep, and he's the shepherd. But when you get into the New Testament, when you, or when you get into Paul's books, it's normally about a fight. It's normally about being a soldier. It's normally about enduring. And he, there's almost a shift there where, where you're called to be a, a soldier. Uh, uh, you know what this is? This is a first century footman, okay? He's infantry. Uh, if this was uh, World War I, they'd call him a doughboy. That was what they called the infantry. Uh, if it was World War II, they'd call him a dog face. And uh, that's just uh, some, some slang there. And, and some, uh, they called him grunts. These guys are just foot soldiers. They're just regular, average, uh, run-of-the-mill guys. There's nothing real special about them, but they're just doing what they're told and following orders, and they're good soldiers. Um, uh, you know what? In, uh, the generals call the inf infantry, they call them uh, the, the queen of battle. And you know why they call them that? It's because you would think it'd be a pawn, like on chess, but they say that the, the queen's the most powerful and influential part of a battle, and they say that the foot soldier is that right there. I think that's interesting because as a, as a, a separated, we're pawns, we're just one piece of the thing, but we make up the bride of Christ. And we're supposed to be the queen of battle, we're supposed to get in the fight. In Song of Solomon, uh, prophetically, the, uh, the, the bride there, she's likened to an army, and that's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be in a fight, we're supposed to be uh, uh, soldiers. Look at, uh, real quick, look at 2 Timothy 2. Now this, this uh, resonates with me because I'm a man. <laughs> And, uh, and I, uh, I like uh, aggressive stuff. I like football and mixed martial arts and shooting and fighting. And so when I see this, it, it does something for me personally. It's masculine. And, uh, and the thing about the, the Old Testament, I was just telling somebody the other day, I think I'd have done better in the Old Testament. I got an old soul. I want to fight with a sword. I don't even want a gun. You know what I'm saying? And I just I want to be right up fighting. And I see that Old Testament. And now you don't get to fight anymore like physically you, it's a spiritual thing but i'm still thankful for it and and god knew he was saving men and he said you know what i gotta liken this to something that's going to make sense to them i'm going to have some men get saved who are athletic or or or, uh, or aggressive or i even think some people are just competitive and he says you know what i'm going to have some men i'm going to liken this thing to a soldier so it makes sense to that man look here in second timothy 2 and in verse 3 he says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him, chosen him, excuse me, to be a soldier. You know what you've been chosen to be? You've been chosen to be a soldier. <laughs> And he picked you out and he says, I got some fighting for you to do. You know what's a blessing? In Hebrews, it calls Jesus Christ the captain of our salvation. We got a good captain. You know, if a, if, a, if, a, if a sergeant goes overseas and gets in the fight, he gets a combat patch. And you know what? I've, I've talked to some military guys. They say if you see a sergeant, it might mean this or that. But when you see he's got that combat patch, you go, I'll follow that guy. 
He's been in combat. He didn't just go over the sea. He's been in combat. I think about Jesus Christ. He's got some scars <laughs> that show he's been in the fight. And he's been resisting the devil a lot longer than you have. You think about every man in the Old Testament who, who lined up across from the devil to duke it out, lost. Every single one of them. Uh, Adam and Eve, what was it? Just a fruit. Boom. Knocked him out. Cain killed his brother. Boom. Knocked him out. <laughs> you look at, at, at spiritual men like Daniel. Well... The, the, the king bows before him and he doesn't tell him to get up. He's committing sacrilege. Boom. Knocked out of the fight. Not perfect. Job, same thing. Had self-righteousness. Boom. Knocked out. And Jesus Christ comes up and he didn't get knocked out. And he's the only man in history who ever did. That's a good captain. He's been through the combat and you can follow that guy. I think about an exodus that talks about how God is he's like a man of war. That means something to me because if he called me to be a soldier, I want a general I can follow into the fight and know I can get through because of him. Look it back to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to spend uh, our time here. He says, finally, my brethren, in verse 10, he says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Now, that first thing I want you to point out, and I'll just kind of be going verse by verse here. Uh, the first thing you see is that it's not your own strength. And that's important. Uh, I was telling you guys in Bible study about this fellow who got saved and tattoos all over the place. And he's sitting there. He goes, now, brother, listen, I, I want to go street preaching. But, I mean, if that guy revs his engine, I'm going to take him off his bike. And I'm like, no, 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 brother Larry. <laughs> brother Larry, you can't, you can't do that. And he's like, if he mouths off about the Lord, I'm like, you're just going to have to let the thing go. And I told him, I said, you can't, you can't be strong in your own strength. He's a strong dude. I said, it's, you got to put your strength in the Lord. Uh, you know, the thing about being a mighty man in this church age is about being strong in the Lord. And uh, your, your, uh, your, uh, the God's strength is made perfect in your weakness. And sometimes you go through things and you're actually stronger because of it. Why? Because you're putting it all on the Lord. And you've got to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. The next thing he says is put on the whole armor of God. Now that stands out to me because the next part says that you may, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That word wiles means tricks. And there's all kinds of tricks in warfare, whether you're flanking, whether you're getting the units to separate and causing division and taking them on one at a time. There's all kinds of things in, in battle. But he tells you, he said, listen, you want to get a, you want to win against the tricks of the devil? You got to put on every piece of armor. You see, the devil knows exactly where your chink is, exactly where the chink in your armor is. And that's where he'll attack. You know what? We're Bible believers. We got the King James Bible here. Man, that's sword of the Spirit. Sometimes we got that one under control. You got the sword of the Spirit, but you don't have any faith? <laughs> You're going to get hit. You're going to get messed up. You got to have the whole armor of God. This next part says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against. Do you know what that means? This whole thing of Christianity has wrestling in it. I was like, Yes. This <laughs> Not only that, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the, the Christian is likened to a runner in a race and a fighter, and he says, not as one that beats the air. So fight I, not as one that beats the air. That's a boxer. You know what happens when you mix boxing and wrestling? <coughs> UFC. You get cage fighting, okay? Now, I know maybe that doesn't mean anything to you, but that works for me. And I go, okay, Lord, I see what you're saying. This guy, he's saying, you know what he's saying? He said, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against. So you're about to see who you're fighting. Uh, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The thing that really stands out to me there, and just allow me to just kind of explain this for a second, he says spiritual wickedness in high places. What is that? That's spirits is what it is. That thing right there that stands out to me is notice where they are in high places. The devil shows up there uh, when Jesus Christ is given the parable of the sower and the seed. It says the fowls of the air come down, they eat up the seed. When he gives the interpretation of it, what is it? It's the devil coming down. <laughs> and not only that, in Revelation 19, it talks about Babylon. And it says that the, it's going to be a, a habitation of wicked spirits, devils, and every evil bird. So you see the comparison there between wicked spirits and devils. He says spiritual wickedness in high places. And what he's referring to is just wicked spirits. And you've got to wrestle and fight that stuff. We talked a little bit about that in Bible study. And how some of those thoughts just come into your head and you're sitting there going, well, is that the Lord or is that something else? Well, I don't know. Does it line up with the book? Because you're supposed to wrestle with that stuff. Not only that, but you know, uh, a, good, a good reference to this is, you know what, sometimes you're supposed to wrestle in prayer. Whenever you go back there to Jacob, Jacob's wrestling with the angel of the Lord, asking for a blessing, and he's wrestling. You know, sometimes you just got to spend some time in prayer, and it's a wrestling match. It's not just, Lord, give me this, and he gives it. He says, you know what, you just need to spend some time there. And talk to me for a little while. We're supposed to be wrestling. 
The Bible talks about uh, warring a good warfare. We were here just uh, when Brother Spurgeon was here a few months or months ago, whatever it was. And he talked about uh, the difference between a good fight and a bad fight. You remember that? That stuck out to me. Because that's something that Paul says. Paul said, I fought a good fight as opposed to a bad fight, which means there are bad fights out there. Fighting with your wife's not the good fight. <laughs> Fighting with uh, one, one amongst uh, each other, that's not the good fight. There are good fights out there. Amen. Fighting for a soul, that's a good fight. I, uh, I, I got to win a soul here not too long ago uh, in the prisons, and it was the longest time ever leading someone to the Lord I'd ever done. I was sitting there witnessing to this guy and gave him the full thing, and it was like a half an hour, 45 minutes, nothing. So I go another half an hour, nothing. And I'm not one of these, like, I'm not going to just, just, will you just repeat after me? I'm like trying to get him to get it, and I'm giving him as negative as I can go, and he's like, yeah, I just don't know, I just don't know. And I was sitting there praying, and I just, while I'm praying, because my buddy started talking to him, I just remember Dr. Ruckman saying, people struggle to pull in the net and finish up the thing. And I said, okay. I looked at him and I just asked him a question. That's what Paul does. Paul does that with Agrippa there in Acts 26. He closes with a question and you put it on them. And I said, okay, you die right now. You're going to hell, right? And he's like, well, no. And I'm like, ah, why didn't we start with this thing? That would have been a good place to start. And I started right there and I sat there, man. And I was, we were sitting there pulling that net and fighting for that thing. Finally, that guy just sat there and he goes, how do I get saved? And I was like, praise the Lord, man. That's a good fight. And you ought to get in that good fight. Street preaching, man, that is a good fight is what it is. And I don't care how the world feels about it. The fact that they feel that way ought to show you how God feels about it. The fact that they flip you off, the fact that they curse you out and blare their music whenever you're sitting there giving the Bible ought to show you where the country is. <laughs> and you go, oh, that's how they feel about God's book. That's how they feel about the words from this book right here. That's a good fight. You ought to get in that fight. That's a good fight right there. You know, uh, one of the reasons that we spend so much time in church, hearing the Bible and teaching and all this stuff, is because a soldier will spend way more time in training than he will actually in the battle. You've got to think about that. You might spend all this time in basic training and then years and years before you're finally deployed only to get in a 10-minute firefight, and that's all you ever see. But you know what? All that training will help you once you get into the fight. That's why we spend so much time and we spend all year after year and all in the Bible and praying and doing all this training is what it is. And verse 13 says, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Uh, like I said before, uh, he knows which piece of the armor uh, you're missing. This word stands out to me. You'll notice that the word stand is all through the passage. Uh, it's in verse 14. It's in verse 13. It's also in verse 11. But you know the word that really uh, stands out to me? Sorry, I, it wasn't on purpose. The word that stands out to me is withstand. Because to me, standing is you're just you're good. But withstanding is like a much stronger force is coming against you and you're doing everything you can and you're withstanding. You're doing everything you can to fight back. I like that because that's, that's a Christian life sometimes. That's that temptation just hitting you sideways and you're blown back and you're on one knee and you're going, no, I have to withstand. You know how you do it? You get the whole armor of God. You've got to get that whole thing on there because you're going to get hit. Now, let's talk for a little while on these pieces of armor. How important they are and even the order that they're in. Ephesians uh, 6.14 says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. The first thing, and the most, <laughs> probably the first thing, most important thing to start your day is truth. That's where you start. You know why I, preachers say all the time, you better just wake up and read your Bible? Because that's the first thing you're putting on. That, that belt. You see, everything hinges on that, on that right there, the loins being girt up. You've got to think about this, the sword. Is on, the, is, on the, is on your hilt right there on that belt. Everything else is connected to that thing right there. And everything hinges on the truth. And you've got to get that thing right. It is so important to start your day in this Bible. Man, I cannot emphasize that enough. It is so important. I can't tell you the difference between uh, going one day without it to, to a day with it. It is just, it's insane. And you've got to think, if you're in a fight, you know what you need? You need good food. <laughs> You think about all these fighters that go into those cage matches. They have people that are hired to give them nutrition because they want to be just as strong and as powerful as they can be. You're going into a battle. Every single day you wake up and you look across yourself in the mirror and you go, there's my first opponent right there, that flesh right there. I've got to beat him today. And you're going to walk out into the world and go, blast it. I've got to fight these guys all day today. And the wickedness that comes off this place and off that phone and off that computer, I've got to be fighting this all day. And then when you're not looking, that lion sneaks up on you, that double. You've got to be fighting him too. 
You know what you need to start your day with? You've got to start it with truth. You have to start with truth. Everything starts on that thing. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the rules, of the old knights had to wear all the armor and these big pieces. And I mean, uh, I was helping a buddy one time, and he had this whole suit of armor. And the whole thing with chain mail and all was almost 200 pounds. And he was ha- he putting it on and going around, but it's all protection. The thing is, the rule of armor is, if it's uncomfortable, it'll probably work. <laughs> That's the, that's the rule of armor. That's what these knights would say. If it's uncomfortable, this is probably going to protect me. You know what truth is? It's uncomfortable sometimes. <laughs> when you're telling a soul, listen, you reject Jesus Christ, you're going to go to hell. That's truth. And it's uncomfortable. But man, you have to start with that. You have to stick to the truth. The truth is uncomfortable. But you've got to stick with it. You've got to start with it. The next thing you see in verse 14, it says, uh, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on... The breastplate of righteousness. Now this one right here really stands out to me, and I'll probably spend more time on this one than just about any of them. But this breastplate of righteousness stands out to me because uh, this is not Jesus Christ's righteousness. Jesus Christ's righteousness is on your soul. And when you get saved, that righteousness goes right on you. But if you'll notice, this whole thing is saying, you take on this. All the armor, it says, you take and put it on. So this righteousness has to do with a daily walk where you're keeping yourself clean. Now, look over, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 2, and I'll, I'll show you what I'm talking about. You have a daily walk of trying to keep yourself clean. Ephesians 2 and verse 8, the Bible says, uh, For by grace, we know these verses well, but just see where I'm going with this. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. So it's not your righteousness that gets you saved. Not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship. Creating Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You know what that means? You are saved by His righteousness so that you can live a righteous life and live clean. I want you to notice that in Ephesians 6, it's not the breastplate of self-righteousness. What I'm saying is it's not where you're puffing yourself up and saying uh, a big thing in the fundamentalist crowd is, well, uh, my standards are higher than your standards. My skirts are longer than your skirts, and, uh, and I, my makeup's less than your makeup. And that, that, that's not what I'm talking about, but I am talking about doing good works and living clean. This thing right here really stands out to me. In John 17, verse 16 and 17, Jesus Christ says, I sanctify them with my truth. My word is truth. <laughs> you know how you start? You start with the, uh, with the, uh, the loins girt about with truth. You want to start off right? You start off with that. You start off with the belts of truth, and then what happens? You can get the breastplate of righteousness. And that's where that comes from. Now that thing right there, I think it comes to, to live and clean. And uh, The Bible says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto, according to that word. You want that breastplate of righteousness? You've got to get the truth. Look at Titus. Titus chapter uh, 3. Titus 3, once again I'll show you this thing about Jesus Christ's righteousness saving you and then show good works on top of it, uh, obviously just in your own life. Titus 3, uh, 3, 5 says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. Salvation is by His righteousness. Look at verse 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. Look at verse 14. And let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. The same things in verse 1. The same things in Titus 2 verse 14 says, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. I'm talking about living clean. You know that breastplate, it, uh, it protects most of your vital organs. That breastplate of righteousness, man, it's right in here, that chest piece. It's protecting you probably uh, more than most anything else. And you know what it is? I think living clean will protect you. It's not comfortable, though. <laughs> living a clean life like you're supposed to, it can be an uncomfortable thing. We're still talking about armor here. And that armor is going to protect you. And that living clean will protect you. But, man, the world... They just want to do whatever they can to strip that armor off you. <laughs> They'll just do whatever they can, man. All these TV shows, man, and they're just putting all this stuff right in front of your face all the time. Something I heard a preacher say one time, I thought it was real good. He said, you wouldn't let a sodomite come in here and sit here and converse with your kids, would you? Nope. You wouldn't let some loose woman come in here and sit and talk with your kids, would you? Nope. 
but you'll put something on that TV and just let it play and let those sodomites just walk right in. You know what that is? That's the world just stripping away some of that breastplate of righteousness. You need to throw that stuff out because it affects you whether you think so or not. Hey, dads, it affects your kids. <laughs> and you sit there and say, I'm good enough. I I'll be fine. This stuff doesn't affect me. What about the ones behind you? <laughs> what about those ones? You're stripping that thing off you and those darts are flying right past. You ought to be protecting them. I know I talked about contemporary Christian music here a little bit ago. Allow me to do it again. I, I, have, a, I have a strong... <laughs> Is it hatred too strong? Dislike, <laughs> hatred, for contemporary Christian music because uh, when I was a teenager, let me tell you something, it wasn't drugs, it wasn't girls that got me messed up, it was music that got me messed up. It was music. I was about this close <laughs> to going off in the world and I'd just be out there doing my own thing and I would be in the drugs, right? <laughs> I would be all messed up and it started with that music. And that thing right there, you need to get that stuff out of there. <laughs> Uh, man, if you can, you get that stuff away from your kids. Get it away from your own ears. And you say, I can handle it. No, you can't. Right. That thing is bringing a spirit every time. You know what happens in Chronicles when they're, when they're singing and giving glory to God? The Holy Spirit shows up. <laughs> shows up so much that obviously the smoke fills the room and all that stuff. And we're not, I'm not talking about that. But you can sing good music and the Spirit of the Lord will show up. And you sing that other stuff, another spirit shows up. <laughs> It's wicked. <laughs> the thing shows up. Me and uh, Brother Jeff were sitting here talking about uh, how, uh, how feminine the stuff is. And that stuff just shows up, that feminine spirit. It's not from the Lord. <laughs> One of those songs says, uh, when I, like I said, I, I used to build these houses with these contemporary Christians. They blared it all the time. And I just wrote down stuff that I'd remember. One of them said, this feeling can't be wrong. I'm about to get my worship on. <laughs> and I'm like, what? What do you mean? That's not masculine. There's nothing godly about that thing. That thing's so feminine, it's not even funny. But all I'm saying is, that stuff, it affects you, and you need to get that out of there. And uh, it might not be real comfortable, but you should get it. Uh, there's some verses in there that are, that are good verses that you ought to apply to your heart, but they're not comfortable. One of them is abstain from all appearance of evil. That thing right there will help you. It will protect you. <laughs> but it's uncomfortable. I think of verses like uh, uh, David said, I'll set no wicked thing before my eye. If you just settle in your heart, purpose in your heart like Daniel and say, I'm not putting this in front of me, it's not comfortable. You don't get to watch what you want to watch, right? right? It will protect you, man. I'm telling you, it'll protect you. Uh, the same thing goes for a verse like, uh, make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. You know what? If, if some men would be manly... <laughs> And realize they've got a problem and throw out that stinking cell phone and quit looking at that garbage. You know what they do with that thing? They've made provision for the flesh. To fulfill the lust thereof. <laughs> you got to throw that thing out. Get that thing out of there. You know what it is? It's uncomfortable, but it protects you. My, uh, my dad was a police officer, I think, for I think like 14 years or 12 years, something like that. And he told me a story of this guy who, uh, who never wore his bull bulletproof vest. And the guy, he'd been there for years and years. The thing is, it was in Tennessee. It's humid. It's, it's uncomfortable. You just got to wear this thing. It's uncomfortable. It's tight. You're just sweating in it. You got to sit in your car all uncomfortable. And he said, there's no chance I'm going to get shot. It's stupid. Little town, no big deal. And for years, he went by, didn't wear his bulletproof vest until one day, he was on the other side of a door. The guy just, bam! <laughs> and that thing got in there, messed up his ribs, messed up some organs. And he didn't die, but I mean, he, he spent the rest of his, I mean, he's still alive, but he's, he's had complications ever since. <laughs> Why? Didn't wear that uncomfortable armor. <laughs> didn't put the thing on like he was supposed to. The armor, then they said, here it is. You can wear it. <laughs> didn't wear that thing. And I, man, that thing stands out to me. Put it on. <laughs> if something's uncomfortable, man, just, just realize you're protecting yourself. You're protecting your family. And you're protecting the church for what it's worth and those around you from getting attacked. Uh, look at verse 15. The Bible says, And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, uh, this right here just has to do with soul winning right here. Notice that it's on the feet. You know what a missionary does? He goes. You know what an evangelist does? He goes. Philip runs to the Ethiopian eunuch to win him. It's on the feet because you ought to be out and ready to go give the gospel. There's some guys like John Wesley. John Wesley wrote about, he's riding his horse, and these highway robbers rip him off the horse and start stealing his stuff. And he just starts witnessing to him. And like, I don't know about you, I'd just be like, no, uh <laughs> I'd throw down so fast. No way, you steal my stuff? Get out of here. And this guy's like, he gets thrown off and he's just like, hey, the Bible says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And these guys are going through his saddlebag there. And he's witnessing to him, man. That old preacher, Tory, he he'd, he'd go in on the dance floors. <laughs> 
and start witnessing to folks. You got know, these people juking. I can't dance. I'm not going to try to. He's up here dancing, and he just and he just go up and be like, "Hey, are you saved?" And they're just like, "What are you doing? I'm trying to dance." Just going somewhere. Dr. Ruckman used to talk about going out on the skating rinks while they're playing hockey, and he'd be witnessing to them. Doing it in restaurants. That man, that's our place. Me and Katie, we get them in restaurants and grocery stores, man. We witness to them, and, that, and the Lord has blessed it. Uh, but Dr. Ruckman talked about one time there was a car wreck. <laughs> he was the first responder. You'd think he'd be pulling him out. He's witnessing to the guy. The guy's upside down, you know, and he's giving the guy the gospel. He didn't want him to die or something, man. You ought to just be going. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this thing, but, but man, uh, they're not in here. <laughs> they're out there. You got to go get them. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, man, that, that thing of street preaching and all that stuff is, is great, but it ought to be your own daily life. I heard a preacher say one time, maybe this is a little strong, but he used to say, he said, don't just go to the store to get groceries. Won't you go to the store to win a soul and get groceries while you're there? I always remember that. It's a little strong, but I was like, there's something to that. I'm just looking for a soul. We went to a football game the other day. My, my brother was, well, you were watching, but he was on the sidelines. It was, it was a hard team, but they won. He didn't play, but it's okay. We were there, and... Uh, and we're just enjoying the football game, man. Watching these high school football game, man. It's a pretty good time. All of a sudden, I look over. My wife's just witnessing these two girls and ends up leading one to the Lord. We went to see the football game, but Katie already had it in her heart. We'd prayed before we even left. Just prayed. Let's say, Lord, just give us a soul today. That's a good prayer, by the way. Stick that one in there every once in a while. Lord, why don't you just put somebody in my way today? It's a little uncomfortable. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Anyway, look at verse 16. <laughs> verse 16, this one stands out to me. It says, above all taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now, this stands out to me because this is the most important one. And he says that. He says, above all, taking this one right here. You see, the Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please him. If I was to be honest, this is probably the one I struggle with the most because I want everything to be worked out. I want to look at everything logically, uh, and I'm thankful for the Bible. If it wasn't for this book, I wouldn't believe it. I'm telling you, I wouldn't. If somebody was just telling me the stuff and, and, and all the stories of Jesus, I wouldn't believe it. But when I see how insanely well put together this book is, when I see that it never contradicts itself, and I see the prophecy in it and how much came through, I go, okay, I believe it now. But that thing of faith is where it's not something you're seeing. <laughs> it's, uh, it's something that you're having to put faith in something, and uh, it's it's... It's not, uh, it's not logical sometimes. <laughs> it's sometimes where you're going, Lord, I don't understand this, but I'm having to lean on you and put faith in it. You know, uh, the thing I think about is that this is the one where he mentions the fiery darts of the wicked. you got to think, just take a second with me and consider these old uh, ancient arrows with these, these steel tips or whatever. They probably had brass tips back in the day. But those, those things, they're fiery. <laughs> He's, he's obviously referring to these Roman times. So these guys had fire on that tip. You, now think about what that would do to somebody. Think about what that would do to flesh, man. That fiery arrow hits you, and you've got to think of blood loss. You've got to think of infection. If you don't die, you're so wounded, somebody else has to carry you off. You see what I'm saying? The thing is, that faith is so important. You see, if you lose your faith, if you drop that shield, you know what happens? <laughs> you get wounded. <laughs> That devil hits you so hard. I've, I've, been, I've seen guys go through Pensacola Bible Institute and like, man, they're Bible-believing, they love the Lord and whatever, and the, you watch that faith start dropping off. See, that shield gets kind of heavy is what happens. And that field of faith gets heavy, and they finally just, they're just not trusting the Lord like they used to. They're not reading the book because it really doesn't mean what it used to, and that faith starts dropping off. And you watch one of those guys who was on fire, used to shout amen, used to go soul winning. Watch him sitting over here now going... I'm agnostic. You know what that is? He dropped his faith off. <laughs> At some point, he dropped that thing, and you know what happened? He's useless now. <laughs> Not doing anything for the Lord, just I'm over here. I don't believe in that stuff anymore. What was it? Is that shield of faith he dropped? <laughs> he had the King James Bible, for goodness sakes. He had the helmet of salvation, but he didn't have that faith. And that's, that's the most important one. Back in those days, it's, I, I've read some stuff about how they would have the, the leather on the shield soaked in this material that when it hit it, it put out the fire. I think that's kind of cool. Uh, another one that stands out to me is uh, we know that uh, one day we're going to go to heaven, right? <laughs> and our faith is going to take us home. Amen. And I think about this, those old, sol those old Roman soldiers, when they die, they'd roll them onto their shield. and they'd, That's how they'd take them off the battlefield. One day you're going to take them off this battlefield, man, on a shield of faith. And that's going to be good, but, but stick with it now. Don't, don't have to wait till the end of the battle to go, oh, it's real. No, it's real, man. You just got to have some faith in it now. Uh, look at verse 17. He says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, 
uh, which is the Word of God. In 1 Thessalonians 5.8, he calls it the helmet of the hope of salvation. And you know what stands out to me about this one right here is that that right there is, uh, it has to do with salvation, but it, I think it really has to do with eternal security. If you run into a Christian who hasn't figured out eternal security, you're, you've run into a useless Christian because that Christian will never grow. <laughs> you see, my dad explained this one time. He said, you know, salvation is this big, wonderful, insanely big thing you can't even imagine. He's like, just imagine it like a house. Someone gives you a house. And then you go to them one day and you're like, I lost the house. <laughs> that doesn't happen. <laughs> you don't lose a house. <laughs> and that thing right there lines up with this thing right here. That helmet of salvation is on your head. But you know what happens with the eternal security? Man, you don't think you got the thing on. Let me tell you something. You can live through a battle with an amputated arm or a leg. You can't lose your head. <laughs> if you get your head cut off, that's the end of the thing. And that thing, that I, you run into these charismatics, that's the big thing. They, they think they can lose their salvation. You'll never see a bigger baby as a Christian than someone who can lose, thinks they lose their salvation. Listen, if you think you can lose your salvation, you can talk about Adrian. <laughs> talk to one of us or me at the end or something. Because you can't lose the thing. You, can't, you don't have anything to do with it outside of accepting a gift. It's finished because of Jesus Christ. Amen. And that thing is so important. Now, uh, let's get to this one right here. First, I've been waiting to get to this one right here, all right? Verse 17, he says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, you know, what you, you know that out in, the, out in the world, they got a gun called a 1911. You know what I got? I got a 1611 right here. <laughs> it's right here. This is a 66 caliber right here, okay? Anybody, if, you're not, if you don't read the Bible, you wouldn't get that joke, okay? <laughs> you know what I think about? I think about, uh, I think about this sword being a beautiful powerful, well-built sword. It's just, man, just uh, every edge just perfect cut, sharper than any two-edged sword. And then I think about a whole pile of rusty swords over here <laughs> that are falling apart and just a mess, and that's those new versions. <laughs> those new versions are over there, and they can cut a little, a little, <laughs> but they're nothing compared to this right here. <laughs> those new versions, they, ain't gotta, they, don't, they don't hold a candle to this book right here. You've got the sword of the Spirit right here. Let me ask you something. How well do you know your weapon? Now listen, no soldier, no soldier goes into battle not knowing his weapon. And you'd be a fool to go in with a gun that you don't know how to chamber the, 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 the round. Uh, you'd be a fool to not know how to clean it, how to take it apart if something was to go wrong. I got a good buddy of mine. He was a sniper, uh, uh, a marine sniper. And he was telling me this story one time. He was running along there. He had an M16. They got in a firefight. This was back in the, uh, the early 90s. And he's running along, and he gets, he's getting shot at by these Egyptians. And he falls, and, the, and, and uh, he was shooting at the same time. And that M16 would cock back. And when he fell, the dust flew up from where his knees hit. And they filled the chamber of this gun, and it was just ruined. And he's like, ah, well, there's nothing I can do. He looked down, and there's an AK-47. And he had all the training in that AK-47. <laughs> he grabbed that thing up. He was back in the firefight in a second. He knew the weapons. And the thing is, what's funny is he told me, he's like, I didn't touch another M16. He goes, that AK-47 was perfect. I used that the rest of the time I was over there, and I'm sure they didn't appreciate that. But the whole point of the thing is he, he knew the weapon, and you've got you to gotta know the weapon. You know what the Bible says? Study to show thyself approved unto God. Jesus Christ said, search the Scriptures. In Isaiah it says, seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. Hey, if you don't know something, it's right here. <laughs> I promise it is. <laughs> if, if you don't understand something, if there's something you don't get, seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. You know what I think about a lot? I think about how, how many stories are in the Bible. And the Bible says they were written for examples for us or in samples. And you know what? Some of you, you, you won't put in the time to find a good answer. You know what happens is, and this is where we were talking about even earlier, about praying and asking for something from the Lord. You won't put the time into the book to get an answer from the Lord. So you depend depend on your own feeling for an answer. You know what happens is, there's, there's some stories in this book like David and Abishai and Jehu. There's some stories back there about uh, Eleazar, the son of Dodo. That's a good one, man. There's all kinds of stories you can go to. And you know what? If you put time into this book, you could go through a situation and go, oh, that was the example the Lord had for me to find. But you've got to know your weapon and you've got to get in there. You know what else I realize? It's a sword. Okay, listen. It ain't a butter knife. All right, now listen, that means it's for cutting. <laughs> and the thing is that Christianity today has done their very best to just dull that sword as much as possible. <laughs> and, uh, and Christianity today, they don't want to believe in hell. <laughs> and you know what that does? That just dulls the sword a little bit more. I just heard, I think it was Dobbins the other day was talking about the Packers guy. Uh, uh, what's it? Aaron Rodgers doesn't believe in hell. Well, you've dulled the sword, man. The thing is supposed to cut. <laughs> 
I'm sitting there talking to a sinner, and he goes, well, hold on. So if I don't get saved, do I, uh, do I go to hell? Well, no. <laughs> I just dulled the sword. I, was, I told the story a little bit ago about fighting for that soul and, and winning that guy to the Lord. I had another cellmate in there who was saved, and he's like sitting there, and I'm like sitting there telling the guy, behold, t- now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. If you don't go saved, you're going to go to hell. And this guy goes, well, <clears throat> uh, well you, I mean, you, you might go to like paradise. And I'm like, shh. <laughs> he's like, he's like, I mean, he's like, you could take it now or you could take it then, but you might as well take it now. I'm like, please stop. Just leave me alone. Let me preach for a second. I wanted to fight him right there. But the thing is, all I'm getting at is you don't need a dull sword. You need a sharp sword. And the Bible says to earnestly contend for the faith. You know, yeah, contend. That's where you get a number one contender in a big, a big boxing fight or UFC, earn, a contender. You're supposed to contend for the faith. You know what? Some of you probably have some, some, some friends or some family. They need a sword to cut them a little bit. The Lord's giving you the sword. You got some coworkers. They don't need the niceties of it. You know what I think is sad is how many people who don't believe in God are going to hell thinking He loves them. Because that's all they ever hear. All they hear is, no, no, God loves you. God loves you. And they go, well, then I don't need to do anything about salvation. I'll just do my own thing. If, if He loves me, He won't put me in hell. Oh, yeah, He will. That love's at the cross. <laughs> you want Jesus Christ's love, you've got to go to the cross of Calvary. Otherwise, the wrath of God abides on you. That sharp sword, man, you, some of you need to just pull it out and use it. I didn't say cut somebody's head off, but cut the heart open is what you need to do. Don't you know that a good soldier would never start taking his weapon apart in the middle of a battle? Think about that for a minute. <laughs> you're out there in the middle of battle, and you're like, eh, this isn't quite right. Start taking the thing apart. and yeah. Let me tell you something right now. You've got Greek professors in these big Bible institutes and all this stuff and these Bible colleges and they take the Bible apart. That's a man who's not in the battle. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, I've never been on a street corner witness somebody going, well, this verse actually means this. No way, man. <laughs> I trust the weapon. <laughs> and God gave you a good sword, the best he could give you, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Don't take the thing apart. You don't have to. <laughs> Think of that time in the Old Testament where that, I think it was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, was fighting. And that sword was so, his hand must have cramped up or something because it said that his hand claved to the sword where you couldn't tell where the sword started and the hand started. It was just all one piece. That's how you should be with the Bible. You know, some of you, you ought to, you ought to be at your, at your job, they ought to call you the preacher because you know that book. I, I'm telling you, I've seen preacher boys do that. That's a good testimony right there. Oh, brother, so a oh, oh, preacher, he knows what that is. He, he knows what the Bible says. Now, almost every job I've ever had, I've had a guy go, Hey, you know, hey, he was wondering about this. What does the Bible say about that? Man, that ought to be you. You ought to have that thing right there. The last thing is verse 18 talks about praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching there too with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. The first thing, and I'm sure you've heard this before. Most people have, but you've got all these pieces of armor, but the one part that's missing is the legs, and it has to do with doing this right here. You get down in prayer, and it blocks that right there. You see what I'm saying? That's the greaves. That's those things that's protecting your legs, and that's staying on your knees and staying praying. Knowing that, notice that at the end it says, with all perseverance. Christianity today has no endurance. They won't endure anything. They won't endure hardness. <laughs> they won't endure someone mouthing off to them. They won't put up with it. They, most, people, most folks won't go door knocking because they don't want the confrontation. <laughs> You know what I think about? I think about in, in, in UFC, one of the things they say, you'll see these two guys get up to fight, and they're just muscled and tattooed and freaks, and they're just monsters. You watch that guy in the third round whimpering like a little kid in the corner getting his head beat in. You know what they say? Uh, exhaustion makes cowards of us all. <laughs> and that thing stands out to me because Paul always emphasizes endurance. I think he mentions it four or five times in 2 Timothy, his swan song. He's wrapping it up, and he goes, endure. You've got to endure. Endure all things. Endure hardness. And he's telling them to endure. And Christians have no endurance. They don't have any perseverance. They don't have any fortitude. Fortitude, I think the word means uh, it's uh, pressing forward in, in pain and adversity hitting you. And just continuing forward. And you ought to keep that stuff in mind and, and have some perseverance in your life. Don't you know there's triumph in Jesus Christ? We talked just a little bit ago. We were singing about uh, uh, victory in Jesus. Man, I'm thankful for that. But man, you want some real victory? You've got to get the armor that he's given you. Every morning you ought to wake up and start 
Start your day with that belt of truth. And you ought to go over there, almost hanging up there in your closet, man. I almost imagine it like that and sit there and say, I've got to get this stuff on right now today because today is the battle. <laughs> You're supposed to be warring with your flesh. That's what the Bible says. You're supposed to be resisting the devil. You're supposed to be fleeing useful lust. <laughs> it's all about a warfare. You know what I think about? I think about those old Roman ranks. And the way they worked was they were all buddied up. They were as close as they could be. And there was no going backwards. <laughs> and you know what happens if they're all on a line and this guy steps back? These guys are open for attack now. <laughs> the same thing happens with a church. You're supposed to be right up here like this, with shoulder to shoulder in this fight, and your guy's right around you. You notice that there's no armor on the back <laughs> because you're not supposed to retreat. The whole thing is moving forward, moving forward. That's how the Christian life's supposed to be. He says, forgetting those things which are behind. He says, pressing forth unto the things uh, which are before. Yeah, that verse that talks about a man putting his hand to the plow and looking back is not fit. The thing is, you just keep your eyes forward. You know, in the military, there are only three acceptable answers. Yes, sir. No, sir. No excuse, sir. And one of these days, you're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You're going to stand before God. And there's only three acceptable answers, man. He's going to sit there and say, uh, what about that time you were at that restaurant and I put it on your heart to give that guy a track? Did you uh, hear me? Yes, sir. Would you give him a track? No, sir. Why not? No excuse, sir. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> the thing is, you know what really I think about? I think about that verse in Revelation 19. That verse in Revelation 19 talks about how the bride is going to come out there at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And it's granted her to, to wear those robes clean and white. And it says, for the righteousness of the saints are those robes. <laughs> You know what I think about right now? This is a breastplate of righteousness. <laughs> on a daily basis, you're supposed to be putting on this armor. You know why? Because you're making a robe for yourself. And there's coming a day when you're finally going to take off this uncomfortable, sweaty armor and put that thing aside, and the Lord's going to go, here, i got something for you. i got this thing. It's the righteousness of the saints, and He'll put it on you. And that's going to be a good day. Now, I'm about done, but I just want to say one thing and just close on, on this real quick. Uh, if you're not saved in here... <laughs> You have no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> like, what? Soldier? And armor? And the devil? And what all that? No, no, no. This, that's not for you. You're not a soldier yet. You're not, you're not even drafted. You're not a volunteer. You're not, you're, not, you're not in the battle yet. You're in the world. But you know what I think about? Uh, there's, a, there's a story. Uh, they made a movie about Marcus Luttrell. I've been told I look like the guy, but I, anyway, he was a, he was a SEAL. I've been, I'm like, if you go to the South, I hear it all the time. I'm like, no, I'm not Marcus Luttrell. But, uh, but the thing is, is that they made a movie about him. It's called Lone Survivor. And, uh, and uh, it was a rough story, man, and uh, a true story. But that day was the deadliest day in those special forces' lives, uh, as far as in history, the most died, because the helicopter came in, and it was, had a full, it was a whole thing full of these guys, and it came in and got shot down. And, I mean, besides, uh, and of course, the, the lone survivor guy, Marcus Terrell, lived, and all his guys died, and then that whole helicopter died. Well, most people don't know this part of the story. Uh, when they were all getting on the helicopter, they were getting revved up, whatever. A man ran in, and he, he, was, uh, he was the best helicopter pilot they had. He, it was his day to go. And he got in that thing, started it up. Everyone was in, about to go. And here came marching up the commander, walked up, and said, get out to the helicopter driver. He's like, what are you talking about? He goes, look, I know you're the best man for the job, but I'm the commander. I need to do this. <laughs> and he had to step off that thing and watch them fly off. And that guy... You got to think that that guy, he's, he's alive today. He's got to think, I was supposed to be on that helicopter. And that commander went and died in my place. What I'm getting at is if you're lost here today, the commander went and died in your place. And you're supposed to be on that helicopter ride to hell. <laughs> You're supposed to be on that thing that's supposed to take you where, you're, where you deserve to go, where you deserve to be judged. And you're the best one for it. And the commander marches up right now. He's marching up right now and he's... Step out. I'll take your place. I'll fly it for you. And he did. He took your place, but you have to accept that free gift of salvation. You can be a soldier today. You can go to heaven and be sure, take on that helmet of salvation, start this thing off right, but you have to get saved. All right, let's all stand. Have a pianist. The Lord's dealt with you at all. You can come pray. Or